So welcome everybody. Good evening. This is Lars Light on behalf of the Psalm Journal. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody and also thank the Psalm Foundation for their wonder wonderful support. And of course, of course, Frederick Wildman, the importer of the beautiful wines of Marchese di Barolo. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm dreaming of being in, in Barolo, as you can see from my background. Uh, if, I, if, if and when I take that down, it'll be a much more humble picture of my home where I'm sitting on Long Island in New York. But we have with us Anna and Valentina Abona coming to us from Barolo. Uh, so uh, as Valentina just said, they're a little lonely, so we're all sort of joining them in their house. So uh, Anna and Valentina, welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. We are so happy and excited to be here yes. together. And finally, we are traveling a little bit. <laughs> finally, finally, finally. Hopefully things will loosen up, but we'll be uh, traveling virtually in the glass tonight as well, which will be fun. So um, if anybody has seen the, the April, May issue of the Psalm Journal just went out. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen it, but I know that it's been online and I posted it on Facebook. So if you saw the uh, lovely story about uh, Marchese di Barolo and uh, its great history, it's a very historic winery uh, dating back to the early 1800s and a very, very key figure uh, in Barolo, uh, actually in many other, in many ways, a key uh, early advocate of prison reform, uh, as well as the woman who really changed Barolo and made it what we know it today, um, was uh, Juliette Colbert, who married the, uh, the, the, the um, Count, F F the Marquis Faletti, uh, and came into, um, sort of had to leave the French political scene, the French, uh, after the French Revolution, found her way to Italy, uh, but still missing France, decided that she wanted to bring some of the French winemaking traditions that were established there uh, back to Barolo and um, sort of helped revamp uh, and recreate Barolo as a dry wine. A lot of people aren't aware that Barolo uh, from the Middle Ages almost sort of a, almost fizzy and sweet like many wines uh, throughout Europe were, um, but she helped create, make it the great wine and was sort of one of the original matriarchs of Brunello um, after she passed and the, the um, she was a, a very devout Catholic um, and, and would, did a lot of work with uh, the, the, the Opera Pia, is a, the correct term, yeah, uh, for great. the foundation that she made, that the family that went into. And then um, several years later, with some different changes, the Abona family, who had a property literally across the road, across the gate, uh, was able to acquire some of the Marchese di Barolo, the winery and some of the property, uh, and help carry on that tradition. Uh, in that first generation, there were a couple of very important women that we're going to hear about shortly as well that continued the matriarch. And in the current, here we have two of the matriarchs continuing to be what uh, Barolo may be called the wine of kings, but here we have the queens of Barolo to join mm -hmm. us tonight. So again, welcome very much. And I have a few questions, but, um, but Valentina, maybe you want to get us started with a little bit of an overview of uh, Marchese di Barolo. Well, I think that you uh, said a very interesting thing before. Not many people knew that um, earlier, before the 1800s, the wine made from this region was actually sweet and sparkling. Uh, yet it was uh, the um, uh, person who then became the uh, president of the uh, United States, Thomas Jefferson, that uh, testified this in his uh, journals. So he wrote uh, in his diaries that the wine he used to enjoy when he was traveling throughout Italy and specifically in Piedmont. So the Nebbiolo, the Nebbiole, who he tasted at the time, so in the 1700s, was actually a sweet, uh, like a, a Masmut Madeira, a sparkling as a champagne, yet austere as a Bordeaux. So all characteristics, which uh, um, of course were due to the different techniques that there were at the time no underground cellar where the temperature could have been more or less stable throughout the seasons, no uh, um, uh, closed barrels uh, where fermentation could be uh, completed. Um, so, of course, the, the introduction of these uh, things uh, changed uh, completely the, um, the winemaking style of the region. And this is really thanks to the intuition of Marquise Juliette, who arrived here full of energy, full of enthusiasm and full of love for her France, also through the wines, and wanted to repeat something similar in her new home, which was then Barolo, where she arrived after marrying 
uh, of course, the last marquee, uh, Carlo Tancredi Palletti. And uh, even though uh, we are not the um, by blood uh, here of uh, Marquis Juliette, we really feel her presence very strong uh, um, in our vision today. And uh, this really allows us to, um, uh, to continue with strength, with enthusiasm, because if she was able to do so in the 1800s, then we should definitely uh, be able to continue now after uh, 200 years. It's great we have more opportunities, <laughs> yeah. That is fantastic. All right. So can I start with some of my questions for you? Yeah. Great. Because I think it's fascinating. I mean, we're here technically um, the the Women's Month has passed, but I don't know about anybody else. Uh, Women's Day, Women's Month, I honor women 365 days a year. Strong, brilliant women um, are, are, are always a, a great value and should be honored. Um, so with that idea, um, I, I think my first question would be for Senora Ana, uh, with your own experience, uh, you had uh, as a pioneering in woman, uh, in, uh, a pioneering woman in wine, um, your own experience was a little bit different than what your daughter is going through, and clearly a little, little different than the great aunts and uh, and the and the Marquesa. But um, as you were developing your career and started going out and traveling and representing the winery and the region, uh, what were what did you find as some of the greatest challenges? The greatest challenge was uh, traveling and uh, I take inspiration from my from a very important travel for me was uh, a trip in South Africa in Stellenbosch region with my husband and with the winemaker with a group of winemakers. We went to Stellenbosch to visit uh, a lot of wineries and I, I was impressed about the hospitality I received in that uh, it was we we're talking about uh, uh, more than 30 years ago, yeah. it was completely different world for me because I was coming from Barolo, small little Barolo, 600 people, no, no guests, no visitors, just people who came at the winery just for buying wine and nothing more because uh, the tour of the winery was, was uh, quite uh, unusual. So I was impressed about these uh, wineries. Uh, every winery was very different in Stellenbosch. One had a big party, uh, aperitivo for, with music. It was for me like uh, Luna Park. <laughs> wine. So I was, I was completely shocked and in love with that, that uh, way of welcoming people. So I went home. I, I wanted to convince my family it was quite difficult because Lange region is very close also in hospitality it was at the timing. So the family were like, oh, and people will come, will visit us, we will have people <laughs> every, every day. And uh, I opened a restaurant. I think it was one of the best experiences of my life. It still, it still is. I am always saying I have three kids, Davide, Valentina, and the restaurant. <laughs> it's something for me important for my experience, for my career, for what I did. That is something that it, it, it was born from, from me, from my idea. Every single thing, something that come from inspiration from my traveling. And uh, it is something that is, is giving me a great satisfaction. Now we have a lot of visitors from all over in the world. Uh, we have uh, the restaurant, like um, is, is organized every course is uh, one glass of wine different. So we can uh, talk about the wine and, and, and present the wine in a different way. So that is something is a very great experience for the people who come. And for me, it's a great experience to have the world at home. That is beautiful. <laughs> just beautiful that's great <laughs> to laugh saying that of course mom has these three kids david and valentin the rest are not necessarily in this <laughs> in <order>. that order <laughs> 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 that's good then well the thing is valentin and and david they grow and move on i don't know that the restaurant will is always going to need the same sort of attention <laughs> But last, they have to, they had to start with uh, doing the the washing up first, and then they went to, to the dining room and to their the single step. I think that I'm proud of them because uh, they also are in love with this uh, way of being very active in the hospitality too. So be part of the not just the guests, but also something that come also from them. That is, I think, is also 
in terms of, uh, of, of learning, of uh, uh, life experience is very important. If you start, uh, the restaurant is a lesson of life for, for, what, uh, for what we do for our job. I think it's important to understand the needs because you take care about people and people maybe you don't know when they first arrive. So that is something that it, it helps more to a lot to learn and to, to understand what, what you can do for, for making people happy. <laughs> yeah. And it's a very significant point that you make in terms of hospitality, as you said back uh, when you came back from South Africa, that it wasn't really being done there. That's a that's a tremendous understatement. Um, Valentina and I were discussing this the other day, how the fact that, you know, especially in America, when we drive through Napa Valley, we're used to that Highway 28, you go, you can stop in anywhere and try a wine, go to the different tasting rooms. And in Italy, you're starting to see that a little bit more. Uh, it's a slightly different structure, but 20, 30 years ago, it was absolutely unheard of. Um, somebody might might ring your doorbell, might have the temerity to ring your doorbell, and they'd probably be welcomed in, but there wasn't the hospitality structure. Uh, I, I used the term the other day that Italy was not user-friendly, uh, and um, you know we have two Piemontese people here, so I think you guys are also a little atypical. <laughs> the most, the, the more region, <laughs> not not user friendly, as you said, because uh, Piemonte is very was very close. I think that now things are changed. I I can say proudly that our when the first restaurant at the wine in a winery, so that was uh, something special and unique. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You've opened P opened Piemonte up. We always say the Piedmontese character tends to be a little bit more reserved, but once you're allowed in, it's very warm. And that's a wonderful thing. So, you know, we, we know how you prepared the restaurant and got things rolling there. Now you, you had your career going and Valentina, I think early on Davide, yes, but Valentina told you that she didn't necessarily want to go into the wine business. That was uh, quite another difficult moment of my life. <laughs> <laughs> To make you be strong, Mama. <laughs> make me. She made me very strong and very focused because usually I don't like to impose things uh, important like uh, lifestyle or something on future. And, uh, I, right. But uh, I did little by little without insisting. I, I was my first lesson, first time in my life that I wait. I wait for the right time. <laughs> so secretively, you you gradually planted those seeds. But she hadn't to, 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 it was very difficult through the phone and never talk about what you think. You think one day you join us, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no word about future. <laughs> I instead think that there was a very well set plan that <laughs> secretly, you know, brought me that. But no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, well, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty close to the truth. Yeah, it's not really a joke. <laughs> So, so Valentina, what then was for you? What was the aha moment? So you said, no, no, I'm not going to do this. Mom didn't pressure you. There were some subtle hints along the way. What really, what was the key to her master One plan? One of the secret ingredients that mom used was asking me to accompany her in her travels. Ah. Um, at the beginning, I was a little bit uh, reluctant to do so. Uh, but then uh, I was, uh, I found myself, I was working in, um, in China at the time where I lived in Shanghai for almost one year. And it was months that I was not seeing mom. So when she asked me to join her in a um, uh, trip throughout uh, Southeast Asia, I thought that was the best opportunity to travel in those countries where I'd never been and to see mom and spend a little time with her as it was months that we were not seeing each other. Right. And there I finally realized that I was probably looking for something that it was already home, that they always had there at disposal for me and they probably prepared me for that, but I wasn't able to realize it until I left Barolo. Right. Mom said earlier, Barolo, it's a small town. You can actually see it framed just in, in your uh, background, in your screen. Yes. It's so tiny that stays, you know, in a picture. We are only 600 people. Yet it's so special and known all over the world because of the great wines that we're able to make here. Not because we are special, but because the region is unique. The terroir is unique. And uh, um, luckily also our grapes are very unique in the sense that they bring the terroir with them. So um, finding myself so far away in, uh, in Asia, in countries which I never knew before, where the culture was so different, 
and yet feel at home because I had a glass of Barola in front of me because I was speaking about our hometown, mm -hmm. about the history of our family. It made me finally open my eyes and, uh, and realize that if I was traveling with Barola, I could have been home basically anywhere in the world. And uh, that made me think. So I went back to my um, internship in, uh, in Shanghai in the office and I felt uh, so lonely. Never, it never happened to me. So uh, um, I was so, um, how can I say, uh, I realized that, that I was so far away and I started working first on the website, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Then on the socials, uh, on Facebook at the time. And by helping with uh, this communication, of course, I had to uh, study more about history, study more about the region. And then I said, you know, why I'm doing this from uh, uh, remotely? Why don't I just go back home and start doing it from there? And that's how she got me in. <laughs> Brava, Anna. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> it was a very, very small, small and silent pressure. <laughs> pressure. <laughs> clearly, clearly. But it was a good plan and it worked well. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to come back to reality here and say that I have more questions and I know you have some more great stories. But why don't we take a little break and taste a wine to start? Because I know sure. that uh, through the Psalm Foundation, 30 very fortunate, very fast people were able to get a bottle each of the Spirolo, the Barolo and the Barolo Sarmasa. Um, so why don't we taste one at a time? We'll taste a wine, tell a story. Since you're in your home, I'm in my home. We'll just pretend we're um, having a little home conversation and talk over wine the way it's always best enjoyed. So tell us a little bit about the first wine. Well, um, I will start first, Mama. We're talking about Nebbiolo, of course, Nebbiolo grape in three different expressions, which are really, really nothing compared to all of the expressions that Nebbiolo can have. So uh, the beauty of this grape, which of course gets the name from the fact that it is uh, foggy on the skin because of this waxy bloom um, given by the Pruina, which is on top of it, and the fact that we usually pick it with the first uh, uh, fogs. So in the uh, latest months of the year, um, before maybe it was November and now a little bit more towards October. Uh, but yes, a grape which can uh, really talk about a terroir, talk about not just a region, but a specific sub-region and perhaps a specific single vineyard within the sub-region. So for Nebbiolo, basically we will travel into deep into Barolo and uh, travel first from the Lange region, then we will move into the town of Barolo and finally into only one vineyard within the town of Barolo. The first, um, the Nebbiolo, um, Lange Nebbiolo, Sbirolo, it's perhaps the most uh, uh, gentle yet uh, um, explosive expression of Nebbiolo. And this adjective might sound uh, uh, strange when put together with Nebbiolo grape, because usually Nebbiolo is very shy, it's kind of uh, timid, it doesn't express too much at the beginning, very austere. Uh, but this Nebbiolo here, it's, uh, it's the opposite, it's uh, really extroverted, uh, it, it plays around uh, with your nose, uh, in your mouth, uh, and this is due to the to war in which this specific Nebbiolo is grown mainly from uh, sandier soils within the bigger Lange. I've actually, can I um, show a map? Please. Yeah. You have share screen? I should. Uh, okay, so here we go. So of course, uh, this is the Lange appellation, which includes both subregion of Lange here down south and Roero up north. So all of this is the area in which you can grow uh, Nebbiolo and make Lange Nebbiolo. So taking into consideration all this big area, of course there are venues within Barolo, which is here, within Barbaresco, which is there, or um, Alba sub area, which are more compact and stony. But in general, we can say that in the Lange, we find a mix of soils, which is, uh, very generous in terms of uh, um, softness, a very sandy soil uh, with a lot of minerals. The food expression is usually something like this. So a nebbiolo, uh, which very easily talks to you. It doesn't need to age too much. As a matter of fact, this wine sees no oak, um, no wood. 
uh, and the name itself, Sbirro, yes. which was uh, chosen uh, by, uh, by dad, uh, specifically really linked to our tradition, even though mom is the one that speaks uh, Piemontese best. <laughs> um, it refer maybe, Mama, you can say it, what Sbirro means in uh, Piemontese. Sbirro means uh, li uh, little, uh, little open children, and children, children. open children, very, uh, very, Exuberant, extroverted, a little bit naughty. So dancing. So really alive, yeah. really, really alive. smiling yeah. expression of Nebbiolo because of this uh, overall situation. So here we can play a little bit and find vineyards which can uh, match personality and uh, and play this more fun uh, role and uh, uh, show this more uh, sunny side of Nebbiolo. Fantastic. It it's a delicious good. wine. Yeah. In practice, you can uh, chill it down yeah. even a little bit because it's so uh, um, easy. You find these notes of uh, um, not just flowers, but fruits that really jump out of the glass, uh, which are typical of young Nebbiolo. And usually we don't see them because Nebbiolo is aged in these biggest expressions of Barbaresco, of Barolo. Uh, but here you really find them very evident, especially at the beginning. Uh, so if chilled tannins are... Uh-oh. Brian, did they freeze or have I frozen? Uh, they froze, Lars. Okay. So while we're waiting for their connection to come back on, I know it's been a cloudy day in the Lange and that interferes with their um, web service a little bit. So um, hopefully they, uh, they come back on very shortly. But in the meantime, I have to say the Spirolo is, uh, oh, you're back. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, yes. we lost you. <laughs> That's okay, we're glad you're back. <laughs> connection here in Barolo, unfortunately, we said this at the beginning is not uh, we can't really rely on our connection so this is the only thing we are back uh, 30 years <laughs> <laughs> and it's a cloudy day right yeah temperatures are changing and climate is um uh, climate, you see is changing weather sorry is changing yeah, yeah. so uh, we are expecting in the next few days uh, uh some storms uh, which <laughs> You know, not really helpful when we need to have the Wi-Fi no, work. No, but at least you've got this wine to comfort. It's a very, now I'll use that term again. It's a very user-friendly Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo can sometimes be very tight, very closed. Um, and and sometimes it has uh, Sangiovese envy because people like to have, uh, they think of, of a young Chianti, a fresh Tuscan wine, whereas this wine is absolutely beautiful, uh, round, soft. As you said, you can chill it down a little bit. It's got beautiful yeah. fruit character, but still that great backbone of acidity. It's still a food wine. You still want to have some lovely dish with it. Mm -hmm. Maybe some Agnolotti del Plin. Yes. But also some some also some something also lighter, like uh, like also fish you can yeah. add with it. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, so, it, it's, it's a very versatile, it's versatile yeah. expression of Nebbiolo. When mom and dad got married uh 41 years ago now. Uh, they had this very long uh, lunch, super traditional, super typical with 20, 20, no, 14, 14, 14, sorry, appetizers. appetizers. <laughs> this is Piemontese tradition. So we have a lot of appetizers yes. and I can really see this Nebbiolo playing yeah. with most of them. Some of them perhaps a little bit stronger in taste profile, some of them uh, definitely lighter. Uh, bacala is also, bacala is a uh, codfish is another, um, um, you might think that is not typical, but it actually can be typical from Piemonte too. And I can see this Nebbiolo with um, a bacala, if uh, maybe with some potato, with something a little bit thicker, because the tannins are smooth, because it has this great energy, but um, of course, uh, great acidity, which is another typical characteristic of Nebbiolo. So great freshness that comes through and makes your mouth water um, very much so that it cleanses it and you can easily um, go from one flavor to the other because Nebbiolo has this amazing 
uh, yeah, a cleaning power that yeah. really allows you to play also with, uh, um, with food pairings. I'm thinking vitello tonato. Yeah, bravo, yes. bravo. Vitello tonato is a good pairing, yes. Thin slices of veal with a little um, tuna and mayonnaise sauce on top of it with some capers. Perfect. Perfect. In my restaurant. Vitello yes, tonato. of course. Where <laughs> else? Nowhere else. <laughs> We'll take that as an invitation and hope to be there soon. All of you, you are invited. <laughs> All the people. <laughs> so uh, let me ask a question to either one of you. Um, if, if you had the chance to sit down with, with Juliette Colbert today, um, by you had a time machine by some miracle, and of course you'd want to show her the Barolos and show her Sarmasa, but what would you tell her about Spirolo? Spirolo? Would she would she expect that? Would she be uh, interested in that, or how would she feel about it? I'm sure of that she was because she first she was the one who, who really uh, uh, understood understood the the, the the Nebbiolo. She wanted yeah. really to do something with Nebbiolo. First, she of course she went to her tradition, uh, French yeah. tradition, yeah. important yeah. wine. But yeah. I think this wine. Is, a, is something very interesting. And she was very curious, I'm sure. She was curious about uh, new wine, something new. I think that she can be very proud of us. <laughs> good, good. She was a great ambassador of the yes. region here. And uh, the overall region, of course, Barolo was uh, uh, where she had her biggest property. Uh, and, and she chose the name of the village uh, for the wine she made here because it happened in the town of Barolo, in the cellars which were in the town of Barolo, but she was really, and she was, she had a very big heart. As you said earlier, she was really into charity, yes. a very yeah. devoted woman. She left all of her belongings to the charity organization, Opera Pia. So surely she was a well accepting all situations and she would have been in love with something even more sure. easy um, and uh, showing all the different aspects of the same region. So I, I'm, and I'm she was the one, she was very, I think, attentive to everything was something new. This is uh, also something new, new way of, uh, of uh, drinking the Nebbiolo. Yep. We are proud of this, uh, this beer. <laughs> I like the, also the name because it's something fresh, something that uh, shows that, uh, happiness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you had, uh, if you had her back here, Today, besides having a glass of Spirolo together, um, obviously she would recognize some things that haven't changed at all from her time and many things she would see that have changed tremendously. Um, what would you want to share with her that you're most proudest that, that you've been able to contribute to the legacy? Well, I would say that, uh, first of all, I would, we would be proud to show her Things that, as you said, never changed as the part of Sella where she started to make this, which uh, um, that kept in a so pristine way. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, he was really able to um, re, um, uh, re bring to life also yeah. barrels that she had, um, uh, she didn't build it herself, but she had built. Right, uh, through her before. barrels. And where the, the, the first Barolo was born, and also that that sellers. So we yes, still too. have five of them, and um, thanks to Dad's intervention, uh, they are perfectly working again in the exact same way as they did before. Nice. So we would be proud to show her how things that she started still continue to bring uh, joy and uh, to um, share the message of this region of this wine in the world. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things that I would be excited to show her is how in time um, certain things haven't changed, but others have. So how present we are all over, how um, it is possible to speak about Barolo uh, for, in the world, even staying on, uh, in our home as we are doing now. She used to travel through uh, Europe, carrying the wine with her, so to share it. Uh, with uh, uh, the other royal families of the um, of the area and uh, where she visited, so she was from the greatest ambassador. And uh, and today we feel like we are contributing to that. So we would be proud to share that with her. We are still every day. <laughs> we are still <laughs> contributing to that. And uh, um, in this 
Um, also, our family before we arrived, so when uh, the family bought the state in 1929, uh, really contributed to send this message. And uh, specifically, the two sisters of our great grand uncle who bought the state um, uh, really worked hard in order to. Uh, they also did many sacrifices. That they they were they working somewhere else and bringing all of what they were um, getting from their own uh, work home to contribute to pay up the debts that they had to uh, contract in order to buy, uh, to purchase the state of the Marchesi and uh, making it continue uh, its life. Um, and one of the things that we're very proud of, I asked my brother to go and get it because I had forgot it, but <laughs> was the, how they kept track of where bottles were going. Oh, These wow. are bottles from uh, the um, 1940s. And they went, I don't know if you can see this, but I hear all these bottles went to New York. So already traveled overseas and now we're uh, just continuing that exactly in this moment. So this would be another nice thing that we would like to share, not just with Marquis Juliet, but also with our great uh, um, grand aunts. Absolutely. Well, I know your great aunts were, were for tremendous promoters uh, in her wonderful book, Labor of Love our common friend, Susan Hoffman, our friend in common. Hello, Susan, if you're out there, uh, tells the story about how your great aunts uh, would send their brother, your, your, your father's namesake, Ernesto, they would, when he was in the trenches in World War I, they would send him care packages with some food, some bread, some cheese from home, and of course, some Barolo, but they would always say, enjoy the wine, use it to keep yourself strong, but share it, especially with the officers. Let them know about the wine we're making here. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, both of them, all the markets that you have both traveled in, where would you say now your aunts were obviously very proud of the fact that Marchese di Barolo made it to New York uh, and it's still here and it's still strong. But now where would you say something that one market or two markets or a handful of markets that really stand out that you're particularly proud to say, wow, our wines are there. We never would have expected that. Well, is, um, we might have different answers here, but I would say that we're very proud to say that we are uh, really much present throughout Italy. So all the different regions of Italy, and uh, we said earlier, Italy was not user-friendly uh, uh, back then. Um, so for some reasons, it is not now, especially when something is coming from other regions, such as wine, as every region makes its own wine and is very proud of it. Um, so to uh, to know that our wines are well appreciated all the way from Trentino Alto Adige uh, to Sicily makes us indeed very proud. But there are a number of countries. I'm yeah. thinking of uh, India or um, mm. India, which was Mexico. quite difficult to, to to enter. We are very popular in India in, um, in the best hotels, in best restaurant, and this is something that is uh, is important because India was not not. It's not easy to find wine to have. Right. We are we our present our Marchese di Barolo is very well known. This is something that uh, we are happy to to have. Or Norway, for example, is another country that is is important for mm -hmm. us. And a lot of also small places also they are very. We they export are in more than sixty countries. So yeah. of course, there's not a lot of quantity that goes to each one of them. But to know that there is a little presence and uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about Barolo for our wines, uh, um, so uh, spread out in the world, really makes us proud. And I think that they would be proud too. Absolutely. But you make a very, very good point. It's a major accomplishment to get into all of those 60 countries. But the fact is, when your aunts were writing that uh, that log, chances are it was easier to find Marchese di Barolo in New York than it was in Reggio Calabria or Palermo. Sure. Yeah. Right? yeah, you're right. Rome, sure. Milan, maybe, but other places? No, Italy was very parochial up until the last 20 years or so, right? Yeah, so well, it was not even a country. You, you know what is very for us, for me, is a, a great emotion when when I go in somewhere along all over in Italy, for example, Sicily or um, Puglia or Basilicata or also Reggio Calabria, the, the Calabria. Uh, the people, the, a lot of people is saying this was my first Barolo in my life. This Marchese di Barolo was one was. was the first Barolo they had when they were little, when 
the grand grandfather or the, the father they they were introducing Barolo was our Barolo. This made me very proud because it's something that it means uh, we were in, um, very well known, but we we maintain this important uh, um, way of of, uh, of promoting all our family. We we didn't, we never change from generation to generation. So we keep uh, maintaining this uh, important commitment. Like Julia, I think that Julia can be proud of this because we did yeah, and we are doing in the same way also now. Also, David and uh, and Valentina, they they are doing great. This maintaining. Absolutely. So let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about the Barolo del Comune di Barolo. Tell us about that very long name, but a very significant meaning to it. Grazie. Okay. So I will bring out another map here to help me with this. Please do. Non No, ma non spero che non fosse questo. So from the Langi region, we are shrinking the, the zoom and uh, we are going more specifically uh, within Parolo region. So only 11 communes, as I'm sure that many of you already know, um, are within the sub-region, the DOCG of Barolo. And Barolo town, Barolo municipality is only one of them. Quite central to the winemaking area. Um, so it, it, we benefit here in Barolo from a very uh, peculiar position. Uh, we are already well protected by the mountains, the Alpi, um, which uh, are surrounding the region of Piemonte, which literally means at the foot of the mountains, all the way up north in the west and also in the south, separating us from the seaside in the, uh, on the Ligurian coast. And uh, in the town of Barolo, we benefit from a double protection because Barolo is actually, um, it means, the name Barolo means low rise place uh, because it's around 300 meters above sea level, while other villages such as uh, La Morra, Novello, Monforte are way higher than us, uh, more than 100 meters higher. So of course there is a um, more uh, uh, unique climate, microclimate in Barolo given by this protection. When uh, it snows in the higher villages, it happens often that in Barolo we don't have snow because it's always a little bit warmer. Um, plus the soil type that characterize the municipality of Barolo. We can generally say that from east uh, to west, uh, soils uh, um, become from uh, um, kind of uh, uh, rockier and stonier to uh, sandier by we reach the uh, by we reach the east um, and in the town of Barolo is where we have the greatest diversity so we still find um, a lot of vineyards that have that more compact and stony kind of soils Marne di Sant'Agata Laminate and uh, uh, in um, uh, towards the east of Barolo, we already find Marne di Sant'Agata, Sant'Agata, sorry, Sabbiose, uh, and also some uh, Sande di Diano, uh, Sabbi di Diano. So um, in, uh, in this area here, in the municipality of Barolo, we really benefit from this mix of uh, soil types, which uh, contribute to a very rich village. And in this Barolo, we want to talk about this village, we want to talk about this great diversity. So literally, Barolo del Comune di Barolo means Barolo wine coming from the commune of Barolo town. So uh, the fact that two, um, um, the two times Barolo is one is the wine and the one of course, the other one of course is the municipality. So is one of those uh, um, uh, menzioni geografiche aggiuntive comunali. So one of those commune um, uh, appellations that include a number of different vineyards. In our case, uh, we play with uh, uh, different ones all surrounding our uh, winery. Uh, some of them um, more compact and stony, some of them a little bit um, more sandy. Uh, the sandiest type of soil is Diano sandstones before I got all the mixed up, I'm sorry. Um, and in here we find all of that, all of that chaos. This is the old map of Barolo, uh, breaking down into different single vineyards, which are 170. Uh, in here we find uh, around 11, which are the ones that we have here in uh, estate vineyards in 
the municipality of Barolo. The most important ones and perhaps known would be uh, Canubi, Coste di Rose, Sarmassa, which we also vinify singularly. And already these three express three very different terroirs, even though vineyards are walking distance one from the other, not even a few hundred meters as the crow flies. Uh, almost at the same altitude with the same exposure, yet three very different expressions. But also we uh, vinify in here, we have in here uh, Ravera, uh, a little bit of that part of Bussia, which is still in Barolo. So really different um, uh, vineyards vinified singularly and then just later uh, brought together. Yeah, okay. So to show the richness of our town. So this is, I would say, a nicer um, halfway uh, between single vineyard concept and the very traditional, the, the classic expression of Barolo, which is still, because it is still born by the blending of different hills, of different uh, sources uh, for, for Nebbiolo. Each one of them vinified um, individually and then just later blend together. So it's a sort of a family representation, yeah, signature, wine, signature yes. uh, wine. Now, uh, and I'm sorry not to, to take away from this one because I want to talk about that. But is the how, what is the 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 um, sourcing of the Nebbiolo for Spirolo is the same type of thing from different vint uh, vineyards? Vin okay, yeah. but in a much bigger region, of course. So okay. not from no, the Barolo sub region, yeah. but from the bigger. So if this right. is Barolo sub region, this. Sorry, sorry, let's do this. If this is the, um, um, the red is Barolo region, the old Lange area, it's all the gray one. So okay. we have much more land there in order to source uh, the Nebbiolo from. And right. vineyards out of Barolo are generally speaking more sandy. So that's why yeah. that fresher expression. Gotcha. Here we find some uh, freshness, of course, but also some character, some strong character, yeah. some uh, nice kicks uh, given by the uh, most compact and stony swills that we find in the town of Barolo. Okay. That's so another... You can see yeah. how Barolo is actually it's low. In the valley. Exactly. In this little valley, this little bowl compared to the other villages which are on top of higher hills. So you mentioned earlier about the um, how it, it, you'll, you're less likely to find snow in the community of Barolo than some of the other areas, uh, which brings to mind a question from my very astute friend, Martin Bili, uh, who asks about the effect of climate change um, and how that has uh, challenged things. Uh, what are the effects of the recent frosts? My other friend, John Fodor, also says the same thing. We know there's been frost damage in France and in Tuscany. Uh, what's going on in, in Barolo uh, in terms of current weather situations right now and in terms of climate change in general? So referring specifically to this last week, uh, we had some frost or two, not necessarily in the town of Barolo, where, uh, as I said, it's a little bit warmer compared to the higher uh, villages, but overall, uh, the situation is uh, is not as um, is not as good in other places. So here we're in a sort of happy happy valley. Yeah. I the would region say. of the middle the center of Italy was very damaged from from yeah. the frost. Mm -hmm. And here we had uh, uh, some too, but especially in the uh, in the higher, more exposed uh, uh, vineyards. So we are monitoring the situation. Uh, fact is that uh, lately we are experiencing not just uh, uh, global warming, but in general, I think it's better to talk about climate change because we have more extreme episodes. Uh, so we have much higher temperatures during summer. Sometimes they reach um, 40 uh, Celsius degrees, if not over. Um, and uh, um, winters are generally speaking more mitigated but with some uh, drops in temperatures uh, uh, later in the year, like now in the uh, beginning of April, late, uh, uh, late March. So, of course, these uh, extremes uh, are not helpful in the, um, uh, the vegetative uh, cycle of the grape starts uh, earlier, but then gets stopped, like in this, uh, uh, in this situation. And uh, um, what happens usually towards summer, 
uh, or spring and then summer is that we have water bombs. We can't even talk about rainfalls. They're really like water bombs, like monsoons that come in uh, very quickly with a lot of quantity of water, which uh, um, drops uh, really um, in a very energetic way. So damaging the grape and uh, um, the water which was lacking in the previous months comes all together so quickly that the soil is not even able to absorb it nicely. So it doesn't really give the opportunity of creating water supply, which is needed from the grape in order to um, use it little by little when needed. So we are trying to deal with the situation, um, allowing more grassing within the vineyards. Um, so to allow this water to stay a little bit more, so to keep uh, more water, uh, we are managing um, canoping uh, differently. Uh, we are keeping perhaps more uh, leaves. On. So you're saying plowing more to open up the uh, the soil? Sorry? You're plowing more between the rows to open the soil for the absorption? We are, um, we are uh, uh, grassing. We are putting more grass, allowing grass to grow more. Within grass, okay, grass, grass. gotcha. Yes, within the, uh, the different uh, lines, uh, so to allow the water to uh, stop because vineyards are kind of uh, steep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the slope is kind of so steep. So it prevents erosion. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And, uh, um, and then, of course, uh, uh, having more leaves, uh, so to um, create a sort of a cushion so uh, yeah. that the water doesn't damage too much the grapes. And eventually, when it gets very warm, then to um, um, evitare, avoid. Avoid, yeah. Thank you. Sunburns. Okay. Very cool. Thank you for that. Um, another beautiful wine, round, soft, great aromas. Um, so 2015 is kind of an exception to all of what we said, <laughs> just to make things uh, uh, easier, because it was actually a um, uh, cooler vintage, uh, which had a lot of uh, uh, rainfalls uh, that allow and uh, good snow, so to create nice water supply. So snow is actually very helpful for the vines because it creates a sort of barrier for the roots, uh, allowing warmer temperatures below the uh, below the snow. Uh, so it, it protects better the, the earth and the roots. Um, and uh, uh, it creates nice water supply because the snow melts uh, little by little. So the earth is able to keep this water and to absorb it nicely. Summer was quite dynamic. So good uh, um, different in temperatures between day and night. Before, uh, tannins and chans were really able to be fixed within the, um, within the skin of the grape. So to allow this great character and great longevity of the wine uh, from 2015 vintage. And uh, well, two questions. Number one, would you mind stopping your share screen so we can see you guys? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and number two, uh, so you, thank you for that information about the 18. What can you tell us about the, the uh, I'm sorry, the 15? What can you tell us about the 18, which is where the, from the Spirolo? It, it was a quite similar vintage, mm. less snow, uh, perhaps more uh, uh, cool temperatures rather than uh, big snowfalls, uh, but still a very traditional vintage uh, from the region. So again, it creates a story. We are talking about this climate change, but the reality is that this happened in, uh, in certain years is just yeah. a trend that things are getting a little bit more anticipated. So uh, spring is anticipated, uh, harvest therefore is anticipated, but specifically for 2015 and 2018, they were very traditional vintages. Okay. Yeah, well, sticking with the 15, shall we uh, talk, talk about and taste the Sarmasa, please? Yes. And tell so, us a little bit about that. That's still in the Comune of Barolo, correct? But it so is one unique hill. Much more in uh, in specific. We have a... And I'm going to screen share again just to good, make good, good. sure they're all on the same page. So Sarmasa is this vineyard here within the 
municipality of Barolo, basically we, my bad, I can do this. Uh, we zoom in into Sarmassa. This is the town of Barolo and this is Sarmassa Vineyard. This okay. would be Canubi, Costa di Rosa. So again, very, very close one to the other. Yet what characterized Sarmassa, which by the way is mom's favorite Barolo. Yes, it is. <laughs> and she will then tell you why. <laughs> it's this um, uh, very rich soil type, rich in uh, terms of a clay, a limestone, very little sand. Uh, the composition is mainly Marne di Sant'Agata laminate, laminated. So roots have really to work into deep, creating um, a big concentration in the grapes. This is perhaps the last uh, vineyard that we harvest uh, because the, it needs more time to, uh, to reach uh, the perfect ripening. And uh, because the soil is very compact, stony, rocky. So it's, uh, it's the root that's very to search what they need. And uh, for this, I love it because I know that he has to a lot of energy for having what you need and this is yeah. i'm always talking about my life it was like this <laughs> exactly. a lot of energy. but then the final uh, the final result is something very very intense very important <laughs> this is uh, the sort of soil type which you can find in sarmassa so oh, wow. bigger uh stone. you need to stop sharing screen so we can see that oh, better sorry, please sorry. i love the maps but rocks are even better sorry 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 so this would be kind of the situation in Sarmassa. So again, it's amazing, even through the white, even through the, the zoom, the magic of zoom, you can see the whiteness of the of the soils there and the, and the stones. So mom usually refers to Sarmassa as the fighter because it's <laughs> the vineyard in Barolo where roots have to fight the most in order to have some juice to go in the glass. And you can tell this nature yeah, yeah. of Sarmassa even through uh, tasting it because it's very close at the beginning. So very, it has a sort of shelter, uh, not yeah. shelter, but a sort of- um, Yeah, so to be conquered a little bit, yeah. little by little and mm -hmm. every, and the, when it is open, it's something that you can't go back. <laughs> sure. Every every mother knows you have to suffer to bear good fruit, right? Right, Anna? <laughs> when, <laughs> when the snow come, you can see the sarmasa. Also, always my dad told me that if you want to find something very, some uh, land, very important, very beautiful land, you have to, to go to see the land uh, during the uh, snow time. And in Sarmasa, you can see the snow, even if it's just snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because of the, um, of the snow course, melt, the melt. It, it doesn't yeah. stay, stay in the yeah. vineyard, yeah. The solar and exposure. The of Sarmasa is kissed by, by the sun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful structure on this wine. A little bit more um, of the of the liquorizia on the finish, the, mm -hmm. the fennel. This great as a freshness given by the minerality Sarmenta. typical of Sarma. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how much more oak wait aging? Keeping your glass and you wait for a while and you taste again. again yes. And then you won't finish. <laughs> no. You yeah, this is it. a wine that keeps you company for a very long time in the glass, but then also in the bottle. Yeah. You're asking how much we can age it. Very long, more than the other. Even if Barolo can you age it for a long time, Sarmasa can stay longer. Definitely yeah. one of the vineyards that can resist for a longer time, even in the bottle. So we have this greatest, this greater collection of old vintages that go all the way back to the uh, 1800s and from the 30s, 1930s. Uh, wines are actually drinkable, so it's amazing to see how uh, something that is alive, like Barolo, yeah. the wine, can really evolve with time and change and tell you continuously and keep change different stories. It's just like a person that gets more awareness and uh, uh, matures. Uh, over time. And all the sarmassa are usually a, um, a beautiful experience. So this uh, a note of licorice, which now we find very evident, mm -hmm. um, keeps uh, staying through. So it's uh, one of the freshest, even with time expressions of Barolo. Um, it's, uh, um, it's a wine that really amazes you because of uh, how uh, um, specific and, uh, and and clean it is. It really goes. Uh, he knows his path. It's just uh, um, 
follows it very nicely, maintaining the typical characteristics of freshness and, uh, and minerality. Well, that was wonderful because you just automatically answered before I had to uh, ask had a chance to ask the questions from Monica at Wine Shenanigans asked about how long to age these last two wines and uh, also how the and uh, Rafael Ventresca asked how the Sarmas evolves over time, which you answered. What would you what do you think is the ideal for the, the Sarmasa and the Barolo di Barolo? What do you think is the Dating. ideal time if there is such a thing? A time. Time. Uh, so if we ask that, he says that uh, the best bottle is the opened one because at least you know what there is inside. And I tend true. to agree with that. I think that more than uh, waiting for the perfect moment because you think that that is the right one for the wine, you should think of your mood of the situation yeah. in which you're enjoying it. But of course, uh, um, this said, uh, but all is an experience at every stage. Now we are tasting both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Massa and Barolo del Comune di Barolo, which are babies. So yeah. they're like me when I didn't want to join the family business. I <laughs> couldn't really talk with me about this because I was avoiding the conversation. Right. And these wines tend to do so. So they are very uh, shy, even though some notes characterize it, of course, uh, like the uh, yeah. fresh mm -hmm. notes, uh, which with time tend to become more balsamic. Um, in a while, let's say in 10, 15 years, they will be already a little bit softer. They will open up more. And then in, in more time, in 50, 60 years, they just become so aware of who they are, of who they are. So there will be no more shy, shyness. They won't be shy, any, shy anymore, but right. they will start shining. So they will really start speaking to you. We had this opportunity, do you remember, Mama, when we... Um, did that event with uh, talking about Juliette Colbert in Torino, yeah. where we went backwards. Was, we yeah. did a comparison between Canuvia and Sarmasca. Wow. And this balsamic note, even after 40 years, was still very, very yeah. evident. Yeah. So freshness is really what typifies, what makes what is typical from Sarmasca. Are there any particular vintages? This is a question from Eric Lachau. Are there any particular vintages that stand out in terms of longevity? In, in the long history of Marchese di Barolo? Well, I would say that vintages like 15 uh, have this potential of mm -hmm. aging even longer because of the, um, of the climate situation, which allowed very strong wines with a lot of tannins, with a lot of uh, antichani, which gives structure and um, structure that can be maintained uh, over time. We had, however, today a Sarmasa 2003. For me, it was amazing, the 2003, because it was a very, very warm and warm uh, summer. I mm. remember, it was, I don't know if you remember, it was the summer where in Paris people were dying for the, because it was yeah. very hot, yeah. wet. No water, no... It was terrible, it was brutal. Dry, but, uh, and at uh, that time, if we were quite uh, worried about the vineyard, uh, the... Um, we, of course, we uh, harvest uh, the Sarmasa a little bit before Sarmasa and the other Barolo, but uh, the Sarmasa 2003 today we had was incredible, incredible. It wasn't the, we were usually as much mm, that when it's very hot, mm -hmm. the, the, the Barolo become like a jam, 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 concentrated. Today was superb. It was Incredible. We are also with my husband, we were very surprised about that. Skeptical at the beginning, yeah. <laughs> but surprised yeah. at the end. But I remember already uh, 20 years ago when, uh, yeah, yeah, 20, 10 years ago when we went at, uh, at uh, in Italy, we had uh, the Sarmasa 2003 with some uh, journalists from the United States, from, uh, from California, and they were impressed about the Sarmasa. And at that time, we didn't care too much about the Sarmasa 2003 because we remember that summer, we never had uh, that uh, Sarmasa, and we were surprised too. Um, it was a great, great uh, experience. And today we repeat. Yeah. And we confirmed that. Yeah. And this is surely due to the uh, conditions of Sarmasa with this a very compact soil. Roots are so much into deep, which are not too affected about what happens uh, above. 
um, and uh, given the long experience that we had in the journals from our uh, ancestors that taught us through time, which we go and consult uh, often just to keep track of what, uh, of what happens, um, we kept more leaves uh, than we did in the past uh, on the vineyard. So to protect, uh, to create shadow and protect from sunburns. So, so it's all repeating history. So when you opened that bottle, when did you open that bottle today? How long before you tasted it did you open it? Oh, uh, we opened uh, in, uh, in the middle. Uh, in the middle of the lunch yeah. and we had it with the, uh, with the second course. Uh, so, so maybe an hour or two? Yeah, but uh, it, it, yeah, it's better to open it a little bit before, but mm -hmm. uh, we like also to see the evolution. Yeah. And even if first is like, is the wine is against you. So it's not easy, it's close, it's different. But little by little, you, you follow the evolution and that is something beautiful for us. We usually try to don't decant because right. uh, we want really to see the beauty of every single moment when you open it. In a glass, uh, is the, the best they can is the glass. Uh, yes. It's easy to, to open the wine, to follow it and uh, take it under control, I think. And don't miss any step. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything left in that bottle? If there was, <laughs> if there was by sheer chance, how long would you continue to, do you think it would continue to stay integral? This is a very interesting question because also all of us, all our families surprise every single time it happened because it happens quite often that we don't finish a bottle and we try, maybe we forget it for one, two days and then we, we try again and it's something that is really a, a great surprise every, every single Time. Is yeah. is two weeks realistic? Could be, could be. Okay. It depends now, on vintages. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right, of course. Now let me ask you another question. Uh, in in the twenty first century, um, when people have to do what I'm doing tonight and use their Coravin. Yeah, that is also a great experience too. Eh? We, so the Coravin is okay because the wine won't evolve in the bottle, open bottle, but it'll evolve in the glass. So you're okay with Coravining? I think that it depends. Um, I mean, it's uh, if you're going to enjoy more than a few glasses, anyways, I would we would just open the bottle. But of course, if you have, I mean, I think it's a matter of opportunities. Coravin is a great tool, especially in our business when we have maybe to taste several wines all at the same time and you can't, uh, uh, and you really can't drink all those bottles at the same or in the next, uh, in the next days. Um, but we have the, the luck in these days that we are all together. And this is something very, fresh. don't get me wrong, it was a difficult year for everyone. And even us all together had our moments. But the beauty is that we had uh, the, um, the opportunity of being together, of sharing also opinions and also wines. So yeah. every night we had a different bottle and uh, we always went for opening it because uh, uh, through the four of us and the day after eventually we had the opportunity to go through it. And I think that that was the, uh, the best experience. Yeah. yeah, that's the silver lining of this whole uh, dark cloud. Very cool. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and again, the one nice thing about the the you know the the Coravin is I decoravined it earlier, so I it got to sit in the glass for a little while and open up, and it, it's showing just beautifully. Um, is you mentioned earlier that Davide was around? Is anybody else with you? Is Davide or Dad in the room? Davide is right yeah, here. Is here. Yeah, he, and he wants uh, to make it is right over there. But well, tell them to come on in and join us. Say fast hello if they can, if they're decent. <laughs> I know dad is a little shy. He's very Piedmontese, right? Very, very Piedmontese. Plus, he doesn't really speak English. So he's always, he's like Sarmasa, always very shy. Exactly. Davide and Davide is very spirolo. Always so very open, ready to jump in, right? I'm a kind, I, 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 I a kind of uh, of this uh, of this uh, adjective. <laughs> Good, thank you. Well, 
Congratulations, Davide, and welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here with you. And also um, for us, it's, uh, it's a very great uh, experience, this one, because um, uh, in uh, this hard year, uh, talking about wine is, uh, is, uh, is really special for us because uh, it, uh, it's a way in which we can, um, how you can say, um, we, we can relax. Relax, yeah. yeah. And enjoy. Yeah. So this, I think, this is a very beautiful uh, opportunity in order to end this uh, this um, uh, work week. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Fun. We work with wine, yet wine is our relax. Yes, of course, of course. That's the the double edged sword. So Anna, for you, one last question, and then we'll throw also the question. Two more questions. So the question first to Mama is what do you, well, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip that around. First, I'm going to ask Davide and Valentina, what was the greatest piece of advice you got from your mother to help prepare you for where you were today and where you're going in the future? Well, we have daily pieces of advice. <laughs> of course. Of course. But it's I think- more pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that one that really uh, signed uh, me at least, but I think it can be shared with Davide, is that mom always uh, taught us to um, to stand up for ourselves. So, so yeah. to um, uh, work for what we wanted. And if we wanted something to go and get it for ourselves. So she she made us stronger. Even if we maybe were not when we were younger, she, you know, even working uh, behind the scenes in the restaurant, first washing dishes and then... Um, uh, during wine to the to the uh, clients, uh, yeah, all these things. Also, uh, uh, managing the, the 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 room, the, the how you the say the, the, the dining room, uh, the dining room. So those are all experiences. As Mom said, you learn how to read the guest, but you also learn how to read yourself because you're exposed to other people. So you get to understand better uh, your needs, what you want, and especially. If, she taught us how to fight for what we right, want. Right, right. Yeah. Anna, do you agree with that? Is yes. that all? Yeah, I think the best lesson is uh, stay with people, meet people. You can you can learn a lot from from people. As I told you, maybe you don't know because it's something that uh, taking care about somebody is uh, the best uh, lesson you can have and make them happy. <laughs> Spro spoken in true motherly fashion. Yeah, fashion. of course. Also, another thing is um, uh, taking care of our of our customer because uh, when we host uh, our guests in, uh, to our re uh, restaurant in, in in our winery, we host them in in our house. So uh, for us, it's very uh, is not a work, but is our uh, daily life. So yep. it's something that has to come from uh, from heart. Not uh, from uh, right. Not, it is not, not for business. Right. I, was, I was meaning that. It's a yeah. Well, it's a people business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the la very last question, then we'll wrap it up. But a question that uh, inspired by Bobby Rallo. Uh, so if it's the four of you, voi quattro gatti, the Fab Four uh, <laughs> in your family, um, what is? We know what the wine is going to be. What is the meal going to be? What's your favorite family meal to share? To share. Uh, to, to share. share. To, to share. have together. Yeah. Okay. All together. You know what I really like? Uh, something that uh, you it need a long uh, cooking, like long time cooking. Yeah. Like for example, brasato al barolo, which is uh, the the um, the course, the meat, the meal that you really can enjoy. You don't need a knife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for and our recipe is for one kilo of meat is a two liters of Barolo, real Barolo, <laughs> and uh, no spice, nothing, just the spice they come from Barolo, and you can really feel the the Barolo spice when after 10, 12 hours of cooking, you you have something that you don't need any knife, just uh, is very very tender, very easy to to eat. It is something. But you, you really can enjoy with Barolo, with the, the, the baby Barolo, like the Biolo, for example. But with the Barolo, is, with the, 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 the great Barolo is something very, 
enjoy that you you really enjoy is the right right uh, meal good so quality we're... meat good quality wine and good quality company yeah. yeah so we're kind of spoiled because when mom opened the restaurant she was not just uh, uh waiting tables but she was actually the cook so she, she's a great cook and in these days uh, we went back to when we were childs with mom <laughs> cooking for all of us, lunches and dinners, and she doesn't want any help. She doesn't allow any help in the kitchen. So Davide, who's really good as well, has to, you know, stay back and the longer cooking <laughs> time is, allow is us to be all together. Sometimes, and not, not always. <laughs> sometimes. So we have, uh, luckily, quite a big living room, but we are always all in the kitchen. When, you know, <laughs> mom is um, uh, cooking and we are all there, kind of helping, but in reality, we're all staying together around the table and uh, already starting with the wine <laughs> and then waiting for the food yes. to arrive. It's better to cook with the wine, with a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> always, always. I, use, I always use wine in cooking and sometimes I put it in the food too. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for letting us into your home, sharing so many wonderful family stories. This has been a very special evening. Uh, for us here in New York now. It's it's going on a little after six. We're coming on dinner time and I'm hungry. Now I need a bar Barolo Brasato, but I don't have time to make it. <laughs> but yeah, I can't wait to uh, to come I, break bread with you. you. Come, I can cook for you. <laughs> I will prepare before. <laughs> if I get on a flight tonight, I don't know if I can though, but <laughs> I would love that. Share a secret. It doesn't have to be a super, uh, can I say, good recipe sometimes just a good uh yeah. even a, a good burger if the meat is good can be yeah. Yeah. you know easy cozy but satisfying exactly real estate or something like this in um, yeah the, uh, last monday we um uh, 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 we celebrate we celebrate, celebrate uh, mm -hmm. our pasquetta which is a uh, um, Easter Monday. Day, yeah, a very special day for uh, for uh, for uh, for us. So uh, we uh, I cooked uh, this grill stick with uh, uh, roasted uh, potatoes. You can say that. Mm -hmm. And um, we drink, we drank uh, two different kind of, of barolo. Uh, one of um, uh, one of it was uh, our baroli barolo, and uh, after baroli barolo, we drink it. Um, we drank. Um, all this were by Barolo, which, which was... Uh... This, this was the size. <laughs> <laughs> that looks fantastic. So we really enjoyed that day because uh, we, we were all together and we drank and uh, uh, ate uh, uh, a lot of great things. So Again, those three key elements. Good food, good wine, and good company. Company, yeah. We agree. Cheers to that. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Salute. Thank you. Grazie. Cheers. And buonanotte. Thank you for everybody. Thank you to the sound. Cheers. Thank you for bringing us to United States. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us into your home. We love more. <laughs> Thank you to the Psalm Thank Journal. Thank you, Psalm Foundation. Thank yeah. you, Frederick yeah. Wildman. And grazie mille, Marchese di Barolo. Yeah. Familia. Yeah. We yeah. wait for you in Barolo. Yeah. We will be there. Grazie. Grazie. Okay. Buonanotte. Buonanotte. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. You can go ahead and close this out. Yeah, how many people? That's beautiful. <laughs>